Welcome to Confessions of a Stenographer, where we are focusing on all things steno and the legal profession. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Candice. And I'm Kenzie. Today, we will be co-hosting this episode of the podcast, and we are ready to confess. Let's get into this. First off, we want to thank you, Shanice, for the opportunity to be a part of your podcast. Kenzie and I are both so inspired by you and everything you do for the court reporting community, so we thank you for having us. To start, Kenzie and I will share with you a summary of our individual steno journeys up to this point and how our paths crossed along the way. I'll go ahead and go first. I've been a freelance deposition reporter for the past 12 years. I'm originally from Huntington Beach, California, but I now reside in Austin, Texas. How I got introduced to court reporting is by witnessing my mom become a court reporter. She started court reporting school right out of high school and then made the decision to quit school to stay at home to raise her kids. 15 years later, she pulled her machine out of the attic and started school again. I can vividly remember her bringing her machine on family vacation so that she could practice. And I will never forget the extreme focused look she had on her face when she was practicing. Her persistence paid off because she ended up passing the California CSR in 2005 when I was a junior in high school. After watching my mom go through school, I had a pretty good idea that court reporting was not an easy skill to develop, but it still intrigued me. I officially made the decision to pursue court reporting school when I attended my mom's graduation and had a chance to speak with the program director. She told me about how flexible the career is and how I could report abroad and make good money without accruing very much student loan debt. That all sounded wonderful to me since I I wasn't sure what I wanted to do out of high school. I then attended theory classes at night during my senior year of high school at Cerritos Community College. I actually started school with the same manual machine that my mom started school with. I didn't mind the vintage beige machine because I felt so lucky to have a machine to start with. Despite the deep depth of stroke on that machine and the stroke intensive theory I learned, passing speeds came easy to me until I got into my 120s. That's when I knew I needed to start incorporating more briefs for common words and phrases in order to get faster. And that's also when I found out about Mark Kislingberry's Magnum Steno Theory. His slogan, write short, write fast, really resonated with me. I slowly but surely converted to Mark's theory and I became obsessed with writing short because I could see how quickly I was progressing the shorter I wrote. I still find joy in shortening my writing to this day because I know it's only going to continue to make me faster. Court reporting school, without a doubt, was very challenging, but I was so fortunate to live at home with my parents during that time and did not have many responsibilities or distractions. School was my sole focus. I finished school in 2008 after three years when we were in the midst of a recession. Unfortunately, it was not as easy to find work as a new reporter back then, like it is today with the shortage of court reporters. In order to start gaining experience right away, I worked as a CART provider for about six months. I really enjoyed working with hard of hearing students and attending different classes where I got to learn alongside the student. But I knew ultimately depositions is what I wanted to do long term. After freelancing for a few different court reporting agencies, I finally found my perfect fit at a smaller, at the time, boutique agency called Chase Litigation Services. As a student, Lisa Michaels, the owner, who was also a court reporter, was my role model, and I felt so honored to eventually work for and represent her agency. The high standards she set and the opportunities she afforded me helped me grow tremendously as a reporter, and I believe set the foundation for my career. Those first few years of reporting, I was the yes girl. I said yes to taking anything and everything. And although that did end up leading to burnout, I learned a lot during that period of time. I sought out challenging jobs and I ended up gravitating towards medical malpractice depositions. It wasn't long before I was consistently pushing out rough drafts and expedites and inching my way towards providing real time. One of the most memorable cases when I first started providing real time was when I had the opportunity to report a couple of the Apple versus Samsung depositions. The situation was they scheduled a last minute depot in the case and Lisa Michael believed in me and asked me if I could cover it. At the time that was way outside of my comfort zone, but I knew I needed to take the opportunity to grow. The deposition went much smoother than I had envisioned it. And surprisingly, I think the hardest part about it was that one of the objecting attorneys 
he had had recent mouth surgery and he had gauze in his mouth. And while trying to object, I could not understand what he was saying. So I had to continue to ask him to repeat. And it was just next level mumbling. Another memorable experience I had in my early years as a court reporter was when I was briefly living and reporting in San Francisco. It was there I was thrown into my first construction defect case. I think my jaw hit the floor when I walked into the conference room and saw there were about 15 attorneys present. Besides thinking about how many copy orders I might get, I was worried about how I would identify each attorney and praying they would not all speak at the same time. I was so grateful I had taken the time to learn Mark Kislingberg's system for easy speaker identification, or I for sure would have been a hot mess. After six years of pushing my limits in the freelance world throughout Orange County and Los Angeles, I decided I wanted to challenge myself in a new way by relocating to another state and city to report. And this is the point where Kenzie and I crossed paths. Kenzie and I first met through the Facebook court reporting group that she used to run called Court Reporting Stena Life. We share similar passion and drive for court reporting, and that naturally connected us. I had been reporting several years already, and Kenzie was at the start of her career freelancing in Beaumont, Texas, which is a very small town in Texas where she's from. She is one of the most motivating and inspirational people I have ever met. And after sharing with her that it was my goal to relocate to another state to report, she encouraged me to do so and also suggested that Austin, Texas might be a great fit for me after getting to know me. After doing my due diligence, I agreed with her recommendation about Austin and started studying for the Texas CSR. It worked out perfectly because the next Texas CSR just so happened to be in Austin. So one weekend in 2014, I flew to Texas to take the exam and Kenzie picked me up from the airport. That was the first time we had ever met in person. Kenzie, do you remember that? Yes, that was the best time. I basically showed her the five best places in and around Austin in one day, which is something that only we could do. You were really the best tour guide. That was such a fun time. I think that was also the first time we ever took a picture together was at the airport. But anyway, I took the exam that Saturday and I remember feeling really good about it. But at the time, you know, I had had my RMR and I had been reporting six years. So it just really helped boost my confidence. So the rest of the weekend, I was able to relax. And like Kenzie said, she gave me the grand tour of Austin. And I pretty much knew by the time the weekend was over that I wanted to make Austin my new home. When I found out I passed, a few months later, I packed all my belongings into my Honda Accord, literally everything I owned at the time, and my mom and I road trips to Austin. I think people thought I was crazy, but it more than worked out, and I still couldn't be happier with my decision. The best way I can describe it is that I felt like a plant that needed new soil to grow, and that's really what Austin has been for me. These past six years, I have grown more than ever personally and professionally. I spent the first year building my court reporting network in Austin and taking every opportunity that came my way. And I will never forget my first assignment in Texas. A few days after getting settled in Austin, one of Kenzie's friends that is a freelancer reached out to me asking me if I could sub for an official at the uh, Bastrop County Courthouse. I did not have any experience subbing in court at the time, but I knew I could survive at least one day in court and I wanted to get my career going there. I drove out to Bastrop and boy, was that a culture shock for me. The small town looked like something straight out of a movie set, and I think the courthouse was built in the 1800s. Nevertheless, it was a memorable first job in Texas. As I started to build my foundation in Texas, I turned my focus to taking on more real-time work, and that eventually led me to specializing in reporting patent infringement cases. There are quite a few tech companies in Austin, so that work is just more prevalent here. I would say that patent infringement and construction defect cases are what I enjoy reporting the most. Unfortunately, 2020 had different plans for all of us, and this past year has been all about embracing change and adapting to the world of remote reporting, which has had its pros and cons, but at this point, I think we're all just taking it one day at a time. Hopefully, that gives you a good idea about my background and Seno journey so far, and I will let you take it away, Kenzie. Wow. Thanks, Candice, for sharing your journey with us. I feel so lucky, so fortunate 
to have had a front row seat to some of those amazing memories. So I was actually introduced to court reporting in middle school after I was caught on AOL Instant Messenger showcasing my keyboard typing skills in front of my best friend's mom, who was a court reporter. I knew after talking it over with her that I wanted to become a court reporter, and over the years there were a few naysayers, such as a guidance counselor at a school I went to after a hurricane evacuation that tried to talk me out of it because of technology, but I really never gave up on this dream. I was the first person in my family to move away for college, and it was then that my mom connected me with somebody that she grew up with who also left our small hometown to obtain the skills needed to become a court reporter. I became licensed in Texas in 2013. I've been reporting for eight years now. And I spent the first two years of my career as a freelance court, report, court reporter, start, start as a freelance court reporter. Um, I worked for a small agency called Jan Gerard and Associates, and my former boss and firm owner actually ended up being the court reporter that my mom had introduced me to when I moved away for college. Her name's Melissa. Melissa Gerard guided me. She let me work in the production room so that I could see how transcripts were put together. She proofread for me, let me pick her brain about anything and everything I had a question about. I remember distinctly when I was in the middle of a deposition one time, uh, the first time I had a CNA certificate of non-appearance, I had no idea what to do. And luckily our conference room was across from our office. So I told them to hold on one second. I walked across the hall. I asked Melissa what I should do when there was a CNA and she gave me advice. She really molded me into the reporter I am today. And I think some of that has to do with marking up heavily with her red pen. Some of my first proofreading jobs, I think that the goal was uh, to make sure that they were perfect and that I was always learning from my mistakes. A machine technician that was working on my Diamante when I first started gave me a piece of advice that has really kind of always stayed with me. He said, dip your toes in every area of this career. And what that really means is try everything out. And that's what I did my first two years. I took depots locally. I drove far away. I reported federal and civil grand jury hearings, school board meetings. I took medical hearings at the behavioral hospital. And I also subbed in court. I sat with people on their couches and listened to their stories. I was even escorted out of a building one time by the FBI after this hearing because there was a protest outside. I explained court reporting to an Alzheimer's patient at the hospital I was reporting who remembered a Carol Burnett skit from back in the day. And I remember a $32 million verdict uh, showing up and there was 12 attorneys there present and all speaking. So like Candace, I was very thankful for a seating chart. I really took on jobs that no one else wanted to take. And to this day, I really am still grateful that I did. I'm thankful for that advice from the machine technician that told me to try out everything, see what you like. I documented all these events throughout the years on my Steno Life page that Candace talked about. I wanted to give future reporters something to look forward to, but I also wanted to give current reporters a place to talk about their daily journeys. This page was originally founded, unfortunately, after I failed the Texas BSR. It was then that I realized the great need for students to have a safe place to ask questions. I, I say safe place because I do remember when I started my journey, I didn't know that you could have a, as silly as this sounds, a machine that was manufactured at a different company than the software um, that you use. So I was on Eclipse and my machine was Stenograph. I didn't know that you could use two different companies Again, that sounds silly, but that's the place that I was in. And I wanted a safe place where people didn't feel dumb for asking silly questions. 
So this place, this court reporting group turned into a place where working reporters were welcome and they actually helped virtually mentor some students from afar. And I did keep up with this Facebook group for the first two years of court reporting and connected with some really great future reporters and reporters, which is how I met both Shawnees and Candace. Candace was a working reporter from California that I instantly connected with. When we first connected, I shared my journey with her and talked to her about the pros and cons of working for a small firm in a small town. And she talked to me about working in the big city of Los Angeles and the surrounding areas and also shared what it was like to work for multiple agencies. I didn't even know that this was possible at the time to work for multiple agencies. In our many discussions, I was really intrigued at what a big city life could look like for me. I never thought about leaving small town USA to enjoy life in the big city. And that was something that Candace and I talked about often. So in those conversations, I talked to her about her desire to relocate. And she quickly decided that maybe Austin was the place for her. We talked about it one week before she left for Paris. When she got back, she decided, hey, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to take my Texas CSR. And then she flew out there. Um, after passing, she moved to Austin. I still resided in Beaumont, but I was going through a divorce at the time and I desperately needed health insurance and a change of scenery due to my circumstances. So what I did at the time was I used my network that I had met on Steno Life to find openings for official ships in Texas. I think that something that is really not stated often enough is Sometimes they don't post the job openings on the county website. Sometimes you hear about it on, you know, through word of mouth. And that's something that I learned during that journey looking for an official ship. And when I did that, I traveled on and off for a couple of weeks. I tried out for several different judges in different cities. Some of the towns were smaller than my hometown and several were much bigger but one night I was waiting on a verdict in a jury trial for one of the judges I was trying out for. And I got a call from a San Antonio number. It was 9 PM. And I was just kind of wondering who is calling me from San Antonio at this hour, but we were off the record. I was waiting on a verdict and I answered and it was court admin from the courthouse in San Antonio. And they wanted to call to offer me an official ship here. At the time, I couldn't respond because at the same time, we were being called back into the courtroom for a verdict. So I actually did have to call them back. But you're probably wondering if I took the job. Yes, I did. It was the best decision that I've ever made. The day after I finalized my divorce, I moved here to San Antonio. And I've now been working here as an official for six years. The first four years, I worked in juvenile courts. My last two, I've been in a criminal district court where we hear much bigger cases. And something I don't think I'll ever get used to is my grandma telling me that her sister, who lives here, saw me on the local news. I probably wouldn't have made it out this way if Candace didn't go first. She set the bar really, really high but that's who she is. She's always challenging me to be the best I can be. She instills in me a work-life balance. She teaches me how to embrace new technology. And she's also taught me the hard, the art of saying no. I used to be the yes girl too. And, and Candace really uh, talked to me a lot about a work-life balance and how it was necessary in order to remain happy. You know, I'll, always remember some of these really special moments with Candace picking her up at the airport, uh, traveling in Austin and showing her some really great places. I'll also remember cheering her on at the NCRA speed contest in San Francisco and watching her name come up on the leaderboard. But I really think a memory that stands out to me the most is when she carried us during our seminar in 2016 here in San Antonio that we gave four days after my dad's funeral. Court reporting really connected us and over the years it's allowed us to inspire each other to become bolder. 
but there's been nothing better than having a friend who picks you up when you have the weight of the world on your back, truly. And fast forward to today, we now have our own Instagram account together called Steno Stories, along with one of our good friends, Kimmy, who lives in Florida. Kimmy and I actually met eight years ago through the hashtag court reporting on Instagram. And after meeting Candace, I really thought that these two needed to meet. And I set up a fun weekend for us to float the river, the Guadalupe. Lupe River in Texas. If you've never floated it, I definitely encourage you to come out here. Yeah, that was so much fun floating the river for the first time. Yeah, now we're all best friends and we talk almost every day. And really the idea and goal behind creating Steno Stories is to use the platform to share our experiences, court reporters, the good and the bad, and provide resources, tips, motivation, encouragement to students as well as reporters and just generally to promote the profession as a whole. You know, I'm a freelancer, Kenzie's an official, and Kimmy is a cart provider and captioner. So I think the three of us pretty much cover all of the different areas of court reporting. Okay, you guys, we are going to go to a quick commercial break now, and we'll be back to chat with you in a minute. Hi, this is Terry with Legal Grins. Are you looking for the perfect shirt that shouts your love for court reporting? legal grins or a lapel pin that demonstrates to the client that you are certified licensed and a stellar professional legal grins how about a snarky mug that gets the message across either in steno or english legal grins cool prints for the legal peeps is what you'll find when you visit legal grins in either etsy or at www legalgrins.com. Welcome back, guys. So we actually shared this yesterday on our Steno Stories page, but I think it's something that's beneficial for everyone to hear how to cross the finish line to get out of school. So something that I think is very important to remember is don't compare yourself to others. And I actually learned this the hard way. One of the first questions I asked a speed student when I was in theory was how long she had been in school. She answered with a certain number of years, followed by a really long rant about how she had been stuck at a certain speed for longer than she wanted to. And I actually unknowingly used that as a benchmark when I assessed my progress in the beginning. I thought that if I could get out of a speed quicker than the amount of time that she had just told me about, that I was doing really well. But it actually took me some time to realize that I couldn't base my future progress off of other people. It's actually not possible to strive for more when you've set the bar based off of someone else's progress instead of your own. So I do have a little piece of advice. When your classmate passes you up, cheer for them. If you see a classmate struggling, talk to them about what they are doing to set themselves up for success. It's amazing what can be shared by two people during a time of struggle that could be beneficial to both parties, even if you aren't the one struggling. It actually doesn't matter how long someone has been in a speed and whether it's a short time or whether it's a long time. What matters is that you yourself strive every day to be the best that you can be, that you leave it all in the machine so that there's no question that you're giving it your all. Kenzie, I totally agree with you and your perspective, but I also think that, you know, some of us, we're just competitive by nature, and although you shouldn't compare your journey to anyone else's, since we all have, you know, a, a unique set of circumstances, I think a little healthy competition can be beneficial, so I think finding a friend in school who's at a similar place as you, with similar goals as you, can just really help you stay on track and stay motivated. And if your friend passes a speed before you, you can use it as motivation to know that you can also do that while at the same time cheering them on. Yeah, totally. I totally agree with that. Uh, another thing that was number two is practice with a purpose. I truly believe that 15 to 30 minutes of focused practice is 
way better than three to four hours of unfocused practice. And I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Scrolling on Facebook, getting up to do something, texting a friend. What you really need to be doing is setting aside a dedicated time to step away from life's distractions. We all know that they're there, but spend some time on finding ways to improve your writing during this uh, really focused time. I think that is so key on getting rid of your distractions, especially social media. I just can't imagine how much more productive I would be if I did not have Instagram and Facebook but that's never going to happen. I will add that another key to practicing or tip for practicing is to practice specifically just your briefs. For me, briefs have been a big ingredient to increasing my speed over time. That and incorporating right hand phrase enders and practicing those. So I have a spreadsheet that contains different categories of briefs that I'm currently working on. So I'll allocate time to practicing and reinforcing those briefs that I'm working on before I do my speed building practice. And just taking the 10 or, you know, even five minutes a day to practice those briefs you're working on can really make a difference over time. I know, well, you should have more, you should be practicing more as a student, but sometimes as working reporters, we can only find five or 10 minutes to spare before a job, but that's okay because that can still make a difference over time. Yeah, it definitely can. And I think the next tip we want to share with you is to identify your problem areas in your writing. In order to progress, you need to be analyzing your writing and identifying what your weaknesses are. So look at your notes where you dropped or where your writing got sloppy and see if you can find a a culprit there. So was it a word that made you hesitate and drop or was it the speed that picked up in that certain area? And since I am a proponent of writing short to increase speed, after every test when I was in school, and I still do this when I'm editing my transcripts, I'll look at my notes and see what phrases and words that I wrote in too many strokes. And I'll find a brief for them, through, you know, the brief exchange um, or just look up a brief for them, ask a friend, a reporter, if they have a brief or I'll just come up with briefs on my own that don't conflict with anything else that I have in my dictionary. Yeah, I think that's really great advice, Candice. I think that you definitely need to be taking something from every test that you get back or every, you know, transcript that you're working on that you need to write down things that you're doing wrong so that you're not making the same mistakes over and over again. I think putting common untrans in your dictionary is something that is a good thing. And what I mean by that is something, say you're dragging in the L every single time, and it's something that couldn't possibly be anything else in your dictionary. Go ahead and put that in your dictionary and define it. Identify common words that you may not have a brief for and get a brief for it. And write down any grammatical errors that you keep making. I think really the only way to improve is to address areas where you could do better. And the fourth tip that we have is setting SMART goals. Now, I love to set SMART goals with my mentees. We revise them every few weeks to make it work for them. And while I think a lot of times that my mentees accomplish these goals, there are some times that they don't and we have to modify them. But it definitely gives them something to strive for. So what are SMART goals? They're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're realistic, and they're time bound. So specific, what do you want to accomplish? So say, for example, a general goal would be, I'm a court reporting student in my 120s, and I'd like to promote to my 140s. Now, a more specific goal would be, I want to gain the speed skills necessary to move up to my 140s so that I can accomplish the ultimate goal of becoming a court reporter. Next is measurable. How much? How many? How will I know when it is accomplished? You might measure your goal to promote to your 140s by determining that you need to build speed to pass two tests 
to get into your 140s. So let's build on the specific goal above. A measurable goal would be, I want to build my skills, my speed skills by practicing five days a week and decreasing my error count weekly. So you see what we did there? We said, how many? I need to pass two tests. I'm going to practice five days a week, and I am going to decrease my error count. Achievable. Your goal needs to be realistic and attainable to be successful. It should stretch your abilities a little bit, but still remain possible. So a good way to evaluate this is ask yourself, do I have the resources? Do I have the capabilities to achieve this goals? Have others done it before me? So say that you, um, you know, want to say that you realistic is the goal within reach is the goal reachable given the time and resources. Are you able to commit to achieving this goal? So realistic, what that really means to me is say that you did not pass the test. You missed it by 25%. It's not realistic to think that you are going to get out of that speed within the next week. So make sure that your goal is realistic. And the last one is timely. Does this goal have a deadline? When do you want to achieve this by? So for example, let's build on the above again. Today is February the 24th. So on February the 24th, I will put on my calendar five scheduled practice days a week in order to gain the speed skills necessary to promote to my 140s. Every week, I will aim to decrease my error count by 1%. By April 24th, I will have reached my goal if I have decreased my error count by 5%. So it's five weeks away, and I want to decrease my error count by 1% every week. If those are my goals, I should get there by April 24th if I am decreasing my error count by 1%. How do you decrease the error count? by practicing, by putting in the work, by gaining the speed skills. You always have to evaluate what you want to accomplish currently. We all know that you want to be a court reporter. How close are you to accomplishing the goal number-wise? What is the percent difference? What is the percent that you need in order to pass this test? Is it 95% and you're at 90%? You need to evaluate this. What's it going to take to get there? Attach a date to it. Give it something. Give yourself something to strive for. You know, um, it's all these little stepping stone accomplishments in between that are going to get you there. You have to constantly improve every week. When I was in my 225s, I did use these exact smart goals that I'm talking to you guys about. And I truly believe that that is what helped me. That's what guided me. That's what I strived for. To sit for the state exam, we had to pass a test. I believe it was at 98%. And I think we could only have 25 errors. I could be way off on the number, but I, I, I strived for that 25 error count. And then what I did was I would reevaluate every, you know, every test I would get back. If I would meet that goal, I would lower the goal, lower the error count. You're always striving to be better than you were yesterday. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about some of the steps you can take as a newly certified reporter. So you just became certified. Now what? What are some of the steps that a newly certified reporter should take? Kenzie, I'll go ahead and take it from there. By the way, that was some amazing advice about smart goal setting. You're making me feel like I haven't been having the smartest goals in place this whole time. So thank you for that. So what are some of the steps that a newly certified reporter should take? First off, I would say build your resume. You want to make sure that it's grammatically correct and that the formatting is correct. On there, you want to list the CAT software that you're using, the version number that you're on, and what writer you're using so that the firm knows that you're up to date with your equipment and technology. And I would also list the organizations that you're affiliated with. 
And one thing that I would recommend is letters of recommendation to have someone vouch for you that you're going to do a good job. That means everything. Have a reporter read over it, give you feedback. You can list your accomplishments or awards in school, internship programs. And I would say another thing is to sit in as much as possible with a number of reporters because you know each reporter takes different types of work so sitting in on interpreted jobs videotape jobs maybe real-time jobs video conference teleconference just any scenario you can learn from is going to help you as you start your career and testing and setting up all of your equipment. Now, this sounds so simple. It really does. But you guys, you need to test out your equipment before you take your first job. And by before, I don't mean just once, a few times, because believe it or not, I had CaseCat, the software, opened twice during my first depot. And what this did was this caused the program to freeze. So I actually had to pause the depot to troubleshoot my equipment. I think something that you need to know is know the different Facebook groups that you can utilize to ask these questions to have supports number in your phone. And something else is continue to practice, continue to build your dictionary. I think we really can all agree that 225 is really an entry level speed. I know a lot of times attorneys talk faster than 240 words per minute, right, Candace? More like 300. <laughs> yeah. So I think in order to give yourself the confidence and decrease your editing time, you, you need to consistently be practicing the high speeds and work on shortening your writing. I completely agree with that. And I will also say that you should continue to strive for a higher certification. Don't stop at the state level certification. Keep going because that's going to really set you apart as a reporter. And you never know that certification can put you at the top of the list to be assigned to a particular job that requires specific services. So that just really shows that you're motivated and you're dedicated to being the best reporter that you can be. And another along those same lines is distinguishing yourself by embracing technology. Learn as much as you can about your software before you finish school so you can make it work for you. I think one thing you definitely should invest in, whether that's hiring a software trainer to set it up for you or learning it on your own, is auto indexing. That is going to save you a tremendous amount of time. And this career is very much about working smarter and not harder. And a lot of that has to do with how well you know your software. So learning how to edit on the fly will also save you time later during editing. And, you know, the faster you're able to turn around jobs, the more jobs you can take and the more money you'll be able to make. Yeah, I can this uh, investing in a trainer to set up my auto indexing was definitely the best money that I ever spent the best investment. And speaking of investment, networking, attending local and national conventions, I know we are in the middle of a pandemic. So we aren't currently having, you know, get togethers in person, which is why it's so beneficial to you to get on social media and network with other reporters in different groups. There's so many different social media platforms out there now, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I believe Shawnee's has been actually talking about Clubhouse too, which I haven't gotten the chance to get on, but I definitely will. I think there are so many places now where you can meet reporters online. And I think the more consistently you're engaging, the more you'll start to stand out. Now, I want you all to hang on and stay right there. We will be right back after this short break. By the way, Candace, what's your brief for We'll Be Right Back? W-E-B-T. Wow, that's a good one. Hi, Terry. Welcome to the podcast today. So tell me, what is Legal Grins? What kind of business is it? Hi, Shawnees. I'm really glad to be here, and I love your podcast. It is so fresh and outside the box. Legal Grins was formed in the summer of 2017 by a stenographer, me, of nearly 30 years. It was born out of a desire to provide entertaining and engaging merchandise for the legal community, specifically court reporters. 
Many of us wanted to wear and display our love for this legal career that has taken such good care of us. So with a combination of rudimentary graphic design knowledge and a quirky sense of humor, Legal Grins was created. Oh my God, that sounds fun. What kind of products do you sell to escort reporters? If you want a mug that has something sarcastic and steno, we've got it. If you want the attorney client to know you are certified and a polished professional, we've got the certified stenographic reporter lapel pin for that. T-shirts, stickers, mugs, lapel pins, hats, and much more. I am so glad we had a chance to talk and I'll be running on over to your shop now. Wait, how do I find you? Well, you can find Legal Grins in Etsy. Just search for Legal Grins in the Etsy search box. And we also have our own website at www.legalgrins.com. That's awesome. Thanks so much for being here today, Terry, and for sharing about Legal Grins. You are so welcome, Shawnees. Thanks for having me. Welcome back, everyone. Kenzie, I heard that Steno in the City 2 might be in Houston, Texas for 2022. Oh my gosh, really? The Steno Stories girls will definitely be there. In closing, we would like to thank everyone that took the time to check out this podcast. This platform was designed just for you and to add value to our profession. You can continue to follow Candice, Kimmy, and I and our court reporting journeys on Instagram at Steno Stories to stay motivated and encouraged. <laughs>